Hello everyone and welcome to video number three of um, extinctions. And in this video, we're going to try and understand what is behind mass extinctions. We're going to see what patterns we can identify in uh, mass extinctions and look at what that means for the potential causes. We'll finish with a brief look at what survives or tends to survive mass extinctions. So this is really uh, us looking into whether we can identify at all um, common ultimate killers. So we dealt with the proximal killers at the end of the last video. We learned that correlation does not equal causation. And now we're looking into this realm of um, the ultimate killers. So it's increasingly widely thought that structures called large igneous provinces um, or and the processes uh, and eruptions associated with those may be a driver of many extinctions. So I've put a definition of a large igneous province on this slide for you. A large igneous province is a magmatic province with aerial extents larger than uh, 0.1 million kilometers squared, volumes above a certain amount, and lifespans of around about 50 million years. Um, essentially, what this means is that they're just large igneous uh, events, eruptive um, extrusions, um, which occur um, at different times in the geological past. The reason that we think that these could be one of the ultimate killers in, um, in some extinctions is because there is a temporal link between this kind of volcanism and extinction. It's shown in at least half of the major extinctions of the Phanerozoic. That correlation is well established. And that implies that large-scale volcanism could be a driver of those mass extinctions. However, that's correlation, and the, the link between the two phenomena is still not fully understood. So we haven't quite nailed causation there. So we can um, we can identify correlation, that definitely exists. Um, people are still working on the causation part of that equation. Uh, a contrary example as to, to why this is tricky is that most some of the most voluminous large igneous provinces, uh, such as the oceanic plateaus of the Cretaceous, were emplaced with minimal extinction. So the volume of magma of these structures can't be the only factor governing their lethality. Right? So um, there's, there's more things at play here. It could, for example, also be down to continental configuration. Some of the best example of large igneous provinces that then cause extinctions or look to have caused extinctions occurred during the time of Pangaea. So it could be where you have a supercontinent um, that these large igneous provinces become more problematic for the things that were alive at a given time. So that is a potential ultimate killer. But again, <clears throat> work is ongoing as to exactly how strong that relationship is. Another obvious and um, relatively well justified um, ultimate kill mechanism is uh, bombardment from extraterrestrial objects, meteorites, asteroids, etc. Even this is tricky to be sure about though, um, because many of the proximal kill mechanisms that we associate with a bollard, bollide impact um, such as cooling and warming, acidification and ozone destruction also occur with large igneous provinces. Yeah, so um, extraterrestrial drivers um, shouldn't be ignored. We know they did uh, exist and have happened. Um, the, a bolide impact is famously implicated at the end of the Cretaceous period. This means an impactor from space. But there has to be a convincing temporal link between impacts and extinctions. And at the moment, this only exists uh, in terms of the Cretaceous Paleogene um, extinction, uh, the one which killed the non-avian dinosaurs. So this lack of impactors associated with the major extinctions other than the KPG, that's the, um, the ones the dinosaurs went at, suggests that impacts are not the main driver of many extinctions. This is an example of an impactor from 20, the uh, 2013 uh, meteorite that hit Siberia. Bear in mind that this is tiny compared to the scale of um, impact that we're talking about to have this, um, this kind of like mass extinction 
effect, even though this had really quite large impacts on the um, cities near where the impacts are landed. So just bear that in mind. It could be that like, like large igneous provinces, when you have a bolide, bolide um, you, when you have an impactor, um, the impact site is really important in terms of the, the lethality, how, um, how severe the impact of that impact is. So that was really terrible English, the impact of that impact. You know what I'm saying though, right? Um, so for example, the Chicxulub impact, this is the one that um, killed off the dinosaurs and some other creatures, such as the ammonites, for example. Um, that struck evaporates and carbonates, potentially leading to a large rise uh, in the level of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, leading to global cooling, and also a an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide you get in the atmosphere, ultimately leading to a period of global warming following that initial global cooling. It may have also released other volatiles that drove acid rain, ocean acidification, and ozone depletion. So that was all on the basis of the, the lithologies of rocks where that impactor finally hit the earth. That could be why that one was so, so bad compared to some of the other impactors um, for where we see um, uh, impact structures in, in the uh, rock record. I wanted to highlight that um, other potential ultimate kill mechanisms include uh, deadly bursts of cosmic gamma rays. There are advocates for that idea, notably in the late Ordovician extinction. Um, and I wanted to finish by highlighting uh, on this slide that ultimately identifying the smoking gun, the thing that did the killing in ancient mass extinctions is largely still a matter of conjecture. We're improving year on year um, as we do more work and we have new analytical techniques to help us understand the fossils of the time and the rocks around extinctions. Um, and ultimately causes vary. And so for each um, extinction event, we're slowly building up a better picture of what caused that individual event in the fossil record. If you want to learn more about where we currently are, or were as of three years ago, um, this lovely review by um, David Bond uh, is on the Blackboard site and is available to you um, to read if you so wish. So a key question then is, once you had an extinction, what is left? We can identify some general patterns. Um, we can say that survivors tend to be generalists. Um, so uh, as we've already talked about, we have specialists and you have generalist, generalists. Um, and species with wide geographic distributions tend to do better than those with narrow ones. And this is both because um, species with wide geographic distributions are less likely to be um, wiped out by a single event, and then because generalists are better able to cope in the post-extinction world. Those taxa that do survive a mass extinction are sometimes called disaster taxa. So these are the um, essentially the, the, the leftovers. The first organisms back on the scene, as it were, after many um, extinctions, will include lichens, such as those shown on the left here, and species uh, like ferns, which were common, for example, just after the biggest of all of the mass extinctions, the Permo Triassic, which we'll be learning about in the next video. Shown on the right here is Lystrosaurus. This is a tusked reptile that was a disaster taxon after the Permo Triassic extinction. So shortly after the Permo Triassic extinction, this thing was found in almost every corner of the sparsely populated landscape of the earliest Triassic. So it looks like it survived and then it was able to spread out across the continents of this time period. And over time then, these disaster taxa um, diversify, diversify. They start to occupy empty ecological niches. We'll be learning what those are in the next lecture, but it just means they start to specialize towards a particular mode of life. Um, and generally, we see that biodiversity recovers between five and 10 million years after um, many of the mass extinction events. The most severe ones, um, recovery may take up to 30 million years. There's some, uh, there are some interesting questions to be asked about the processes by which um, recovery occurs, and we'll cover some of that in our paleoecology lecture, so that's next week again. Um, there's evidence, for example, of provincialization of terrestrial um, faunas 
following the end Permian mass extinction, i.e. species become more fragmented and their ranges become smaller um, across this transition period. Um, but with that, that is the end of this video and we're going to be back in number video number four, slightly longer video that one, looking at the um, five big mass extinctions of the Phanerozoic. So I'll see you in a second.